For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Beneath the vast, indifferent sky, a tragedy unfolds. The symphony of nature, usually a source of solace, now seems a cruel counterpoint to the crushing silence in our hearts. We stand here amidst the untamed beauty, forever marked by the loss that stains the landscape of our memory. Footsteps faltered, laughter stilled, dreams shattered. What was once a shared adventure now echoes with the hollowness of absence. The wilderness, a metaphorical mirror reflecting the raw beauty of existence, witnesses the quiet unraveling of dreams beneath the canvas of starlit skies. In the heart of the wilderness where every rustle in the underbrush and every whispering breeze seem to carry the burden of an unspoken tragedy, one can't help but feel the overwhelming weight of sorrow. Yet, amidst the heartbreak and solitude, there lies an enduring beauty, a poignant reminder that even in tragedy, nature's resilience mirrors the strength within the human spirit. The wilderness, a stage for both life's fleeting joys and its heart-wrenching sorrows, becomes a sanctuary where healing begins and where the echoes of lost love find solace in the eternal embrace of the wild. This is the Outdoor Disasters Heartbreaking Tragedies Marathon. For Naya Rivera, her Lake Peru outing would be tragic. Naya Rivera, 33, is a woman of many talents and a bright star in the entertainment world. Born on January 12, 1987, in Santa Clarita, California, she began her acting career at a young age, appearing in various television commercials and series. Her journey to stardom was marked by determination, resilience, and a passion for her craft. Naya's breakthrough came when she landed the role of Santana Lopez on the hit TV series Glee. Her portrayal of the sharp-tongued and complex character resonated with audiences around the world. Naya's singing ability and acting prowess shone through, earning her critical acclaim and a dedicated fan base. Her character on Glee allowed her to explore important themes of self-acceptance and love, becoming an inspiration to many. Off-screen, she used her platform to raise awareness and support for various causes close to her heart. However, life wasn't without its challenges for Naya. She faced personal struggles and setbacks, but her determination never wavered. She became a loving mother to her son, Josie, whom she adored and cherished. Motherhood brought immense joy and purpose to her life. On July 8, 2020, she and her four-year-old son, Josie, embarked on a boating trip to Lake Peru in California. A mother-son outing was always something she looked forward to doing, but on this day, both of their lives would change forever. Little did they know that Lake Peru hit a very dark past. The 1,200-acre or five-square-kilometer reservoir was formed in 1955 by flooding a steep, tree-lined canyon and constructing the Santa Felicia Dam. It has gained notoriety due to its treacherous conditions, marked by strong winds and frigid waters. Despite being a local favorite, the lake has earned a grim reputation marred by numerous fatalities throughout its history. When an unfortunate incident occurs, it may take weeks or even months to locate a victim's body, if a recovery is possible at all. Residents are apprehensive about swimming in its waters, where certain areas plunge to depths of up to 150 feet or 15 meters. Beneath the surface, an eerie forest of 20-foot or 6-meter trees poses a threat to swimmers capable of trapping those who venture too close. Debris is a common sight throughout the lake, and hidden dangers abound, including submerged cliffs, sudden riptides, and chilling underwater currents that can prove fatal, even for the most seasoned swimmers. Ferocious winds, strong enough to capsize sailboats, regularly sweep across the lake. The protection of a life vest offers no assurance as evidenced by the mysterious drowning of Danilo Carranza in August 1994, despite wearing one. His lifeless body washed ashore five days later. In July 1997, a frantic father named Liborio Dominguez leaped into the water to rescue his young daughter after she fell from their boat. Miraculously, the child was saved, but Dominguez tragically never resurfaced. Two months later, Isidro Castillo, 22, decided to take a swim while his girlfriend watched from their boat. Witnesses recounted his sudden struggle, 
but she couldn't reach a buoy in time to assist him. In October of the same year, Ulysses Anthony Mendoza, 30, was swimming with his family in 18 feet of murky, turbulent water when he inexplicably slipped beneath the surface and met a tragic fate. Local rumors of a curse surrounding the lake gained momentum in 1998 when Arthur Raymond Caladara, a lake employee, met a mysterious demise. His lifeless body was discovered floating near the dock after he failed to report for his shift, suggesting a possible accidental drowning. For student Vai Xuan Dang, a month would pass before his body was found 500 feet away from the dam, where he was last seen swimming with his family in June 2000. In 2008, another father disappeared after jumping into the water to rescue his five-year-old daughter, and in 2010, a 36-year-old man tragically drowned in the presence of 24 friends when their boat was carried away by the wind. His lifeless body was retrieved from the lake's depths two days later. Despite authorities' awareness of the dangers, the lake remained an unsafe place for swimming. Yet, on that fateful day, Rivera and her son ventured out onto the perilous waters, seemingly without a care in the world. Naya had every reason to feel at ease while being on the lake with her young son. She had been going on boating trips in Lake Peru for years. Familiarity with the location was not an issue. In fact, while on the boat with her son Josie, she reached out to her father, George, via FaceTime. George tried to advise her against taking a dip in the lake, especially without an anchor for their boat. She would always bounce stuff off me, George shared in an interview, and she wanted to go swimming with Josie out in the middle of the lake. But Naya was known to be a strong swimmer and was always confident in her abilities. George, however, couldn't shake the uneasy feeling in his gut as he watched the wind whipping the water. I could see that the wind was blowing and my stomach was just cringing. I kept telling her, don't get out of the boat. Don't get out of the boat. It will drift away when you're in the water. When the call cut off, George admitted he had this bad feeling that was killing me. Unfortunately, George's hunch became a reality hours later. Naya and Josie's original plan for July 8, 2020, was a lakeside barbecue at Lake Peru. However, upon arrival, they decided to rent a pontoon boat for a three-hour excursion. They set out from the dock around 1 p.m. with an expected return by 4 p.m., embarking on a tranquil day together on the lake. For Naya, a celebrity seeking moments of serenity amid the spotlight and the tumultuous aftermath of a highly publicized divorce, escaping the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles was a welcome respite. Upon reaching their chosen spot, Naya snapped a photo of Josie and sent it to a family member while still on the water. Soon after, they both leaped off the boat into the lake together, a joyful mother and son moment. While Josie was wearing a life vest, Naya, confident in her swimming prowess, chose not to wear one, a decision that would prove fateful. Disaster struck as the boat began to drift and rock violently, buffeted by the notoriously strong winds that Lake Peru was known for. Wind speeds that afternoon reached up to 21 miles or approximately 34 kilometers per hour. Acting swiftly, Naya urgently called out to her son, instructing him to get back onto the boat. With remarkable courage and maternal instinct, she did everything in her power to ensure her precious child's safety, successfully helping Josie back onto the boat's platform. However, Naya found herself in a perilous situation, unable to reboard. She struggled in the water, desperately calling out for assistance. Witnessing his mother's distress, Josie searched the boat for a rope while Naya battled to stay afloat. But something was pulling her down beneath the surface. The combination of cool water temperatures, formidable waves, and the presence of rip currents created a challenge, sapping even the strength of a strong swimmer like Naya Rivera. Despite her efforts, she soon vanished beneath the water's surface, never to be seen alive again. When the boat became overdue for return after its three-hour rental, staff found it at the north side of the lake, with Josie wearing a life jacket, sleeping alone on board. After Dorsey was found at about 5 p.m. in the Narrows, an area north of the lake that can be quite deep and windy, a 911 call was made and a formal search and rescue operation was launched. The boat was searched and an adult life jacket was found on board along with Rivera's identification. Rivera's vehicle, a black Mercedes G-Class, was found in the parking lot by the dock. The sheriff's office suspended the search and rescue operation that evening and resumed again the following day. On July 9th, 
the sheriff's department confirmed to NBC that Rivera was presumed dead and that rescue efforts would now shift to recovery efforts. On July 11th and 12th, Rivera's parents and stepfather, brother, ex-husband, Ryan Dorsey, and close friend and Glee co-star, Heather Morris, joined the search team at the lake. The sheriff's department explained that the visibility was so poor, it was more probable Rivera would be found by using sonar devices combined with dive teams. On July 13th, it was announced that a body had been found floating in Lake Peru by divers when the search resumed in the morning at around 9.30 a.m. The body was confirmed to be Naya Rivera's at a press conference held later that day. Rivera was officially declared dead on July 13, 2020. On July 14, the Ventura County Medical Examiner released an autopsy report stating that the cause of death was an accidental drowning and she was likely caught in a rip current as the boat floated away. There was no evidence of injury or intoxication. The complete toxicology report was made public on September 11, 2020. It said that small amounts of prescription medications for anxiety were found in Rivera's system, as well as caffeine. She also had a negligible blood alcohol content at the time of her death. The autopsy concluded that none of these factors led to intoxication or contributed to her death. People drown in California lakes every year. In these big reservoirs, there's a lot that goes on. There are plenty of currents. Steve White, a former Ventura State Beach lifeguard said, he further elaborated that large waves and rip currents can quickly become deadly, especially when someone caught in them begins to panic. More than 20,000 people signed a petition asking authorities to place warning signs about rip currents at Lake Peru titled Lake Peru Warning Signs stating that Ventura County locals won't venture into the lake because of the danger. Naya Rivera is not the first nor the last to go missing at Lake Peru, wrote petition organizer Aaron Jordan. Lake Peru is a very deep lake with very bad whirlpools. People have been asking for years for the city to put up warning signs for swimmers. A photograph attached to the petition shows a sample warning sign about rip currents that includes safety tips for what to do if swimmers are caught in one. The world mourned the loss of a talented actress, a devoted mother, and an advocate for change. Naya's passing served as a reminder of the importance of water safety and raised awareness about the risks associated with recreational activities on open water. Naya Rivera's legacy lives on through her work, her advocacy, and the impact she had on those who knew and loved her. She is remembered not only for her talent, but also for her resilience and the love she had for her family. In her memory, her fans and the entertainment industry celebrated her life and contributions, ensuring that her spirit remains alive for generations to come. She left a lasting impact on the entertainment and the lives of her loved ones. Naya was a loving and devoted mother to her son, Josie. Her dedication to motherhood and the bond she shared with her son left a lasting impression on those who knew her. A month after her death, it was reported by someone close to the family it had been an unbelievably difficult time for her family and loved ones, and Josie was doing better every day. Josie is with his father, Ryan Dorsey, full-time, the source said, adding that, all things considered, the young boy was coping well and understood that his mother was gone. Ryan's whole world is Josie right now, the source shared. Ryan is still grieving and is very much struggling with the loss of Naya, but he stays strong and keeps going for the sake of his son. Ryan, in an interview with Entertainment Tonight, stated, Some days are harder than others. It's hard for me when Josie will say certain things and if he misses his mom, or he'll bring up certain moments that obviously he'll never forget from the worst day of his life. When Ryan was speaking with George Rivera about his mom, Ryan would tell Josie that his mom is an angel in heaven. 
Little Josie just wanted his mom back and stated, that's where I want to go, to heaven to be with mommy. For Sam Kim, he would leave a lasting presence on Mount Baldy. Sam Kim is an avid mountain hiker from Los Angeles, originally from South Korea. Sam was known to set grand goals and it surprised no one when he vowed to climb Mount Baldy more than anyone. Sam's dedication to the mountains had slowly become the most important thing in his life. His wife, Sunny, their four children and five grandchildren had watched him evolve from hiking enthusiast to evangelist, from an every Sunday Catholic to someone who'd skip church to climb a mountain and he'd vowed to climb Baldy 1,000 times before his 80th birthday. Sam was an expert at uphill climbs. When he came to America in 1981, he arrived as Suk Du Kim, 43 years old, a well-respected manager for the Bank of Seoul. After 17 years working in the South Korean capital, he was offered a position managing an American branch that served the growing Korean-American population in Los Angeles. So he became Sam, Three years later, when his job transfer expired, he resigned so he could remain in his adopted home, later attaining citizenship in 1988. Together, Sam and Sonny opened a gas station and convenience store on the corner of Venice Boulevard and Vermont Avenue, south of Koreatown. Business was good, but after a decade without a break, Sam grew weary of the toil, the tension, and the violence. He and Sonny sold the convenience store and opened a gift shop in Burbank. Their newfound calm and leisure time compelled Sam to reconnect with his past. He began to daydream about hiking the hills beyond the city. He started out hitting the trail on weekends and holidays. Hiking in his native country was an expression of national pride, and Sam often reminisced about his own childhood spent galloping around the countryside where he lived. At age 69, 13 years after opening the gift shop, Sam retired. He began spending every free moment he had in the San Gabriels, gravitating toward long uphill slogs that require as much mental toughness as they do quad and lung strength. But as he neared 70, Sam had more questions about his life than answers. His relentless pursuit of the American dream left little time for looking inward. So he went looking for answers in the mountains. My father was a very spiritual person and this became his time to reflect on his life. He began to say he felt God's spirit in the mountains more than at church, Sam's son David said. Sam first hiked to the summit of Mount Baldy in early 2000, but it wasn't until June 7, 2007, when he hiked to the top via the less traveled and less forgiving ski hut trail that he fell in love. He felt an instant bond with the mountain's steep switchbacks and returned to hike to its summit every chance he got, quietly accumulating a sense he found freedom there and peace like he hadn't anywhere else. He was home. Sam entered a new, freer phase in his life. He was finally able to give himself fully to hiking, often with Sonny by his side. The next year, in 2008, the two began making annual trips back to Korea to section hike the 450-mile Bekdu Dagon Trail. Sam would later write a guidebook about the trail. Meanwhile, he continued making his weekly, sometimes daily, pilgrimages to Mount Baldy. By the end of 2013, it is estimated that Sam climbed Baldy 300 times. The camaraderie Sam found on the mountaintop extended to the quirky off-grid community in Baldy Canyon. Through brute repetition and an outgoing personality, he endeared himself to the locals. To reach the summit of Mount Baldy, it's an unforgiving nearly 4,000-foot ascent over 4.5 miles to the top. Beyond the map kiosk, the route starts out on a deceptively gentle fire road. Just one mile in, the steeper ski hut trail zags away from the main Baldy Road Trail and up toward the Sierra Club's San Antonio Ski Hut. At the 80-year-old green cabin, the trees thin and the steep, scree-covered amphitheater of Baldy Bowl looms ahead. It was here on the summit that Sam saved the life of Ethan Ponce. In late November 2016, the same year Sam climbed Baldy 250 times, Ponce and a friend were trying to sneak in an ascent before the summit was consumed by an approaching storm. Ponce and his climbing partner did in fact make it to the top. However, by the time they arrived, so had the weather. Clouds engulfed us, 
Winds gusted over 40 miles per hour and sleet pounded our faces. And it was so cold my phone battery died, Ponce said. A few steps after starting down, just as Ponce was beginning to panic, he spotted Sam, who was on his way up. His eyelashes were covered in snow, Ponce says. I asked him if he would guide us back down. He said he would under one condition, that we return to the summit with him for a selfie. Once, when Deputy Richard Farrow of West Valley Search and Rescue was looking for four lost hikers who had gotten stuck high on the mountain after dark, he ran into Sam at 2 a.m. Farrow asked Sam if he had seen anyone on the mountain. Sam tells me, don't worry, they're not injured, they're just lazy, Farrow recalls. By the end of 2016, Sam had climbed Baldy more than 750 times. He was known to set off at all hours and in all conditions and his routine captivated other hikers. People started calling him the spirit of Mount Baldy. He first made the news for his accomplishments. In 2016, the LA Times ran a story titled, Hiking Mount Baldy? You'll probably meet Sam, a 78-year-old mountaineer. His legend was growing among the Southern California hiking community. Local bloggers posted about him, and message boards lit up with Sam sightings. He was also known as the mayor of Mount Baldy. On the morning of Friday, April 7, 2017, Sam waited longer than usual for the freeways to thin out. He parked up at the Manker Flats trailhead that afternoon and set off up the ski hut trail a couple of hours before sunset, with clouds descending. Shortly after he began his hike, the weather turned ugly. It was really bad, and by evening it was horrific. I lived in Claremont, at the bottom of Baldy Road, and if I can hear the storm outside my house, that means that at 10,000 feet it would be coming down hard, rain, snow, and whiteout conditions," Deputy Farrow said. Nevertheless, Sam had climbed Baldy in extreme conditions before, many times. Whatever he walked into that day wasn't anything he hadn't seen. I noticed it had rained that afternoon, and I remember thinking about him that evening. I wasn't worried, but I wondered if he was cold, his son David said. David woke up the next morning to sunny skies in LA. He called his mother to see if Sam had returned. He hadn't. But once again, David thought his father just had other plans that day. Or perhaps he had bunked down somewhere near the mountain or slept in his car and was already headed up the mountain again. He always came home. By late Saturday, there was still no word from Sam. David called his mother over and over asking if she had heard from him. Finally, they both went to bed, fending off dueling emotions about Sam's invincibility and his vulnerability. He was a solo hiker nearing his 80th birthday, but also someone who knew Baldy better than almost any other human on the planet. The evening had slipped into the night. It wasn't unusual for Sam to keep odd hours, but his wife Sonny and his son David worried all the same. It wasn't the first time Sam had stayed out overnight, he would sometimes sleep in his car so that he could hit the trail at sunrise, but it was the first time he hadn't returned home without calling. The next morning his phone was going straight to voicemail. Sonny was worried enough to call one of Sam's friends to see if he had heard from him. He hadn't. David, who lived just a few miles away from his parents, tried to fight the anxiety by reminding himself how tough his father was. David woke up before sunrise and drove by his parents' house. The driveway in the Culver City neighborhood of Los Angeles, where Sam's car normally sat, remained empty. The moment he noticed the empty driveway, his heart sank. He immediately began driving toward Mount Baldy. On the way, he phoned a hiking buddy of Sam Dick Tufts to ask him if he could see his dad's car in the parking area. Tufts confirmed that Sam's white Land Cruiser was there. He also immediately laced up his running shoes, grabbed a backpack, and set off to Ski Hut Trail. When David arrived in the village of Mount Baldy that morning, he stopped at the visitor center to file a missing persons report. It landed on Deputy Farrow's desk. When we had to search for Sam, we weren't just searching for an individual. We were searching for a friend, he says. I just couldn't believe it. Sam had always tried to encourage his son David to hike more, but David, who is a physician, says he was never really an outdoorsy guy. Even his two young sons had been up Mount Baldy more times than he had. That Sunday, however, David wanted nothing more than to climb Baldy to help search for his father. But the SAR crew insisted it would be safer for David to remain at the fire station. Instead, 30 or so trained volunteers fanned out toward the Sierra Club ski hut, while David waited nearby for any word about his father. The next morning, 
Sonny and her other son, Kenneth, arrived in Mount Baldy Village. David and his younger brother were finally allowed to join the search, while their mother remained at the command post. As David and Kenneth made their way toward the top, for what would be David's 15th ascent and Kenneth's first, they shouted their father's name and hoped for a miracle. By Monday, more than 50 members of West Valley Search and Rescue were scouring the mountain looking for Sam, including a specially trained Alpine unit. At 2 p.m. on Tuesday afternoon, a full four days after Sam set off up the trail, Deputy Farrow got a call on his radio saying that the helicopter had spotted a body face down on the trailless north side of the mountain, about 2,000 feet below the summit. There was no mistaking the blue jacket. Sam was found in a steep, rocky bowl, which would have been rhymed in snow and ice the last day he climbed Baldy. I honestly believe that when he began descending he simply didn't turn far enough, Farrow says. He lost his bearing and ended up just slipping and going down that chute. The medical examiner suggested Sam likely died before his body came to rest. He died at 78. That's a respectable number of years. But more importantly, he lived 78 years and died on a mountain he loved, surrounded by the clear blue Southern California skies and remembered by the outdoor community that he inspired. Everyone from Sam's family to Deputy Farrow is quick to point out one thing they are all certain of. Sam summited that day. At the time of his death at age 78, he had climbed Baldy more than 800 times and was on track to reach 1,000 by his 80th birthday. But despite Sam's own obsession with setting goals, numbers are not what defined him. Every climb mattered. That's something those left behind take comfort in. They may never fully understand what drove him to the top of that mountain again and again, but Sam did. Dick Tufts misses his friend, but sees the poetry of Sam dying while doing what he loved. I still feel like he is around me at times, he says, especially when I'm out there on the trail. Since his father's death, David has hiked Mount Baldy nine more times and says he will continue to do so every Father's Day. It's the ultimate tribute, and it makes me feel closer to him, he explains. The cemetery where he is buried is only a couple miles from where I live, but when I go there it doesn't seem like he's there. He's on Baldy. For the students and faculty of the Oregon Episcopal School, their Mount Hood climb would be a tragedy. In May 1986, a cohort of Oregon Episcopal School students embarked on a hike up Mount Hood, joining the school's base camp outdoor program. The story begins on the evening of Sunday, May 11, 1986, with Frank McGinnis driving his 15-year-old son, Patrick, to the Oregon Episcopal School, where the bus would meet the students. He bid farewell to his son, but felt uneasy about the trip. Father Thomas Goman, the school's 42-year-old chaplain, and an Episcopal priest who was also an experienced climber who had previously ascended Mount Hood numerous times, led the expedition. Despite impending bad weather, Goman remained confident in his ability to navigate and ensure the safety of the climbers. Oregon Episcopal School, a small private academy in Portland, Oregon, ran a program called Base Camp, an educational experience modeled on the principles of outward bound and a requirement for all 10th graders, who were scheduled to make the Hood Ascent in four separate groups. The idea was to help students grow by putting them in a challenging environment that required problem solving and teamwork. The students climbed aboard a yellow school bus, carried their heavy gear down its narrow aisle, took their seats, and drove on off, looking forward to the adventure ahead to ascend Mount Hood. On board was Marion Horwell, the Dean of Residence and Student Affairs, parent and chaperone Sharon Spray accompanied her daughter Hillary. Also on the school bus was John Whitson, nursing a hangover, seeking solace against the cool window. Despite his discomfort, he's excited about the trip, though not particularly fond of Father Tom. Ralph Summers had been hired as the technical consultant for all four of the OES outings on the mountain. Summers arrived earlier than the bus at Timberline Lodge and chose to catch some sleep inside his vehicle while he listened to a marine weather radio. A storm front was predicted by late afternoon. The sound of the school bus woke Summers around 2.30 a.m. Summers ensure the students are well prepared for the ascent. He's confident in their gear and optimistic about the climb's outlook, 
despite forecasted storms later in the day. Summers and Goman share a brief discussion about the weather, agreeing to monitor it closely during the climb. Father Tom rallies the students, outlining the climb's duration and the ascent's challenges. With a view of the snowy slopes illuminated by starlight, the group prepares to ascend over 5,000 vertical feet or 1,500 meters, eager to conquer Oregon's highest peak. With thick glasses and a beard, people often mistook Father Tom for a mild-mannered librarian, but he was invariably the most powerful member of the climbing party. Goman had been climbing mountains since the age of 13. He'd climbed the major Cascade peaks in Oregon and Washington, was a member of the American Alpine Club, and had been to the summit of Mount Hood on at least a dozen occasions. Four upperclassmen students on board were members of the advanced climbing team of the climbing program, Molly, Susan, Mick, and Lorca. The ACT members would watch over and inspire the sophomores during the ascent. If a younger student desired to turn around and descend, an ACT member would escort them. Molly Shula was a senior and had made successful ascents of Mount Hood since her sophomore climb. The other senior ACT member was Susan McClave, an all-league soccer player and captain of the varsity team. Junior Lorca Fitcha grew up knowing mountains and her father was a highly respected rock climber. Father Tom had taken his ACT members up the south side route to gain experience on the mountain. On each of these attempts, their teacher had turned the team around and retreated when faced with inclement weather. Mick Garrett, the second ACT member from the junior class, had successfully ascended the mountain a year earlier as a sophomore. Father Tom organized the students into groups and distributed climbing gear. Summers, confident in Goman's experience, acknowledged the plan to monitor the weather and turn back if necessary. With encouragement from Father Tom, the group embarked on their ascent. Molly led the group through Palmer Snowfield. Concerned about staying on schedule to avoid the predicted bad weather, she balanced pacing the climb without exhausting the sophomores. Sophomore Giles Thompson plods through the thick snow on Mount Hood's southern face. Despite his strength, the two-hour climb in the dark has taken a toll. The soft, deep snow has strained his knees and hamstrings. Spotting a rundown structure called Silcox Hut, Giles heads there for a breather. Mick joins him, barely winded. Giles feigns composure, but as dawn approaches, he realizes the layers are too much for the impending heat. Mick arranges for him to catch up after changing. Giles, relieved, sheds his raincoat, surprised by the climb's difficulty, but eager to tackle Mount Hood. Mick navigates Palmer Snowfield, realizing the climb is tougher than expected. The deep snow leads to exhaustion, with three students and an adult chaperone turning back. Mick eyes the younger climbers, fatigued yet determined, and decides to push himself further. Suddenly a climber collapses. It's John Whitson, expressing a desire to quit. Father Tom's reaction surprises Mick as he lashes out, an unfamiliar behavior. Mick notices John's anger towards Father Tom but intervenes, requesting John to return, a decision reluctantly agreed upon by Father Tom. So John and Mick turn back, heading back to the lodge. Further up, sophomore Pat McGinnis struggles with the bitter cold and fatigue, contemplating waiting while others proceed to the summit. Ralph Summers and Father Tom approach, noticing Pat's distress. At this time, the weather is taking a turn for the worse. Fearing worsening weather, Summers suggests pressing on. Pat, with a classmate's encouragement, continues, doubting his ability to reach the top. As they near the summit, Summers senses trouble. The climb's difficulty and the encroaching storm worry him. He advises Father Tom to turn back, but Father Tom remains determined while Summers hurries ahead to scout. Then, the storm comes in full force, engulfing the climbing party. The sudden storm separates Summers from the climbers, forcing a retreat. In the chaos, Giles descends amidst low visibility and fierce winds, spotting trail markers and hoping to navigate back. Spotting a second trail marker, Giles feels relieved, hoping they will still serve their purpose. Battling the relentless wind and snow, he pushes ahead, realizing the urgency to move faster due to the worsening storm. Summers rushes back to aid Pat McGinnis and Susan McClave, dangling on a steep slope. With Pat barely conscious, Summers coaches him to use an ice axe to climb up as he assists them to safety. As the storm worsens, Summers suggests building a snow cave to shelter from the elements. Aware of the impending darkness and lethal conditions, Summers hurries to find suitable snow to carve out a shelter. 
acknowledging the escalating danger of the storm. Ralph Summers clutches his shovel, scraping the ice above him on the evening of May 12, 1986. For 90 minutes, he's been on his knees, crafting a cave in the snow high on Mount Hood. The blizzard's howls quicken his pace. Properly constructed, this cave will shelter 13 stranded climbers, including Summers. His facial muscles numb and his forearms ache, but he persists. Inside the icy white cave, six feet long, eight feet wide, and four feet tall, smaller than a four-person tent, he assesses his progress. With time constraints, it's as large as it can be. Summers needs to get the climbers out of the storm. Some show signs of hypothermia. Summoning his flashlight, he crawls out, nearly knocked by a gust. Twelve people huddle under a snow-covered tarp. One by one, Summers guides the climbers into the cave designed to shield them from wind and snow. But Patrick McGinnis, suffering from hypothermia, remains under the tarp. Summers calls out to him, but there's no response. Panic sets in when he lifts the tarp to find Patrick missing. The storm's fury obstructs Summers' view. Frantically searching for Patrick, he knows time is critical at this altitude. His heart races as he ventures out, calling for Patrick. Finally, Summers spots him, lying face down on a slope. Quickly, he rescues Pat from the brink of danger, pulling him up to safety. Relieved, Summers helps Pat into the snow cave, ensuring everyone's inside. Now, they wait for the storm to pass, hoping for rescue. Molly Shula gazes upward at the snow cave's arched ceiling, barely a couple of feet above her head. Illuminated by classmates' flashlight beams, the darkened space is congested, limbs entangled in an attempt to fit. Patrick McGinnis and Ralph Summers' arrival showed that not everyone can comfortably stay at once. They take turns, rotating outside every 20 minutes to free up space. Molly, lying on a thin layer of cold water from melted snow, tries to shift, but is pinned down. Suddenly, a noise draws her attention to the cave entrance. Father Tom Goman crawls in, shivering violently, his frost-coated head alarming Molly. He had been outside too long. Concern floods Molly as she sees Father Tom's distress. She recalls his kindness and her admiration for him, and it hurts to witness his suffering. Unable to speak due to the cold, she turns to Ralph Summers for help. They cover Father Tom with a sleeping bag, offering extra warmth and space. Despite his attempt to assure them, Molly senses Father Tom's worsening condition. Feeling helpless, she wishes she could seek aid, but knows the blizzard outside makes it too perilous. As she rests back on the cave floor, the howling wind intensifies, amplifying her sense of helplessness. Meanwhile, Mick Garrett wakes up in Timberline Lodge, disoriented and realizing they haven't returned yet. Rushing his friends, they head back to the bus, only to be greeted by an intense snowstorm, surprising them all. Worried about the climbers on Mount Hood, Mick feels concerned by the storm's severity. He anxiously waits, fearing the worst for his classmates stuck on the mountain, realizing that John Winston's hangover may have saved his life. At home, Frank McGinnis awaits news, worried about his son Pat on Mount Hood. Despite reassurances from school officials, he calls a friend, Dave, who alerts him to the massive storm. Feeling helpless, Frank's concern escalates, realizing the severity of the situation. He manages to fall asleep, but wakes up abruptly in his living room, anxious about his son Patrick's delayed return from climbing Mount Hood. The time and weather raise his concerns further. His relief at the ringing phone quickly turns to dread upon hearing that the climbers, including Pat, are considered lost on the mountain. The words weigh heavily as Frank tries to grasp the idea of his son, frightened and lost on the daunting slopes. It's 1.30 a.m. in Portland. Search and Rescue volunteer Rick Carter converses with Barry Wright, both with Portland Mountain Rescue. Wright relays the grim situation of the student climbing group lost on Mount Hood amidst the fierce storm. As Carter listens, he gathers his survival gear from the closet. This situation seems perilous, reminiscent of the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. Checking his medical bag while on the phone, Carter confirms his departure to Barry, confirming the rendezvous at Timberline Lodge. He readies himself with layers of protection for the prolonged storm. A few hours later, Carter arrives at Timberline Lodge, keen to gather crucial information from the students who left the climb early. Despite their lack of specifics, Carter plans the search and rescue mission from the ski patrol office turned command center. Carter, fueled by impatience, stands among rescue workers at the ski patrol office turned rescue center. 
They discussed the rescue strategy, waiting for dawn before launching teams. Carter's urgency stems from the risk of hypothermia among the missing climbers, especially the teens. Finally, with dawn approaching, teams assemble for the mountain ascent. Carter leads one team, determined to find the climbers. Barry Wright gestures towards a Mount Hood map affixed to the wall and outlines their starting route. Wright has scaled Mount Hood 24 times, familiarizing himself intimately with the terrain. Tasked with coordinating the rescue effort from base operations, he's been preparing through the night, knowing that swift action is crucial in such harsh conditions. The lives of those trapped near the summit hang in the balance. Glancing at Rick Harder, the leader of Team One, Wright confirms his readiness, leading his team out, followed by another rescue squad. Facing his colleague, Dave McClure, another Portland Mountain Rescue Coordinator, Wright inquires, how soon can we get the next teams moving? McClure responds, they're ready, but we only have one snowcat. We can send up two teams at a time. Frustration grips Wright. The snowcat, while efficient on snow and ice, moves slowly. It will take at least an hour for it to return after dropping off the initial teams. As McClure briefs teams three and four, Wright revisits the Mount Hood map, meticulously verifying their search routes to maximize their chances. Meanwhile, inside the snow cave, Molly Shula feels an urge to move from the dampness but realizes her legs are unresponsive. Panic sets in as Father Tom alerts the group about Molly's condition. Summers reassures Molly that her legs are simply asleep due to pressure. After a few moments and deep breaths, the sensation returns, relieving Molly's anxiety. However, their relief is short-lived as a student, clearing the cave entrance, loses the shovel in the storm. Molly's wilderness training warns her of the impending danger. Without the shovel, the cave could become sealed, risking suffocation. Patrick McGinnis, inside the snow cave's access tunnel, fights against snowdrifts freezing into ice, threatening to seal the cave. Despite his efforts, exhaustion and hypothermia set in, leaving him gasping for air. As his classmates strive to poke breathing holes, Pat's resolve strengthens, fueling his determination to survive. Giles Thompson emerges from the snow cave, enveloping himself in a hug for warmth. Despite the storm persisting in the dark, it's his turn to maintain the cave's entrance. Ralph Summers advises regular entries and exits to prevent it from freezing shut. Giles heads to the tarp, sheltering the climbing party's supplies, hoping to find extra clothing. However, all he finds is snow. Panic sets in, and he desperately starts digging, his hands numbing in the thick gloves. His search is crucial. The cache holds not only clothing, but also food and a stove for melting snow into water. Struggling with the heavy snow covering the cache, Giles manages to uncover a corner but fails to lift it without a shovel. Defeated, he returns to the cave, realizing their predicament without the essential gear. Ralph Summers witnesses the group's deteriorating condition. The cold and lack of provisions are causing hypothermic symptoms. Father Tom, sacrificing himself for the student's safety, exhibits severe signs of hypothermia. As Summers recognizes the gravity of the situation, he knows immediate action is necessary. He decides to seek help and calls for a volunteer to go with him to venture out into the storm to get help. Molly Shula steps forward. Summers, touched by her bravery, prepares to venture into the storm with her, aware that the lives of those remaining in the cave now rest on their actions. With determination, Summers and Molly step into the raging storm, committed to finding help and ensuring the survival of those left behind. Molly Shula wrestles to move along the ice-coated slope stretching ahead of her. Ralph Summers was barely discernible through the driving snow despite being a few feet away. He gestures for her to follow him to the edge of a sharp descent. Swallowing her fear, Molly presses onward. Her mission is to descend this mountain and rescue her companions. Just steps behind her lies the snow cave that offered shelter for the past 12 hours. Nine classmates and two faculty members from Oregon Episcopal School are still huddled inside. As Molly inches closer to Summers, he pulls her toward the steep precipice and indicates the descent. We need to go down there, Molly. It's not a sheer drop, more of a steep slope. We'll have to slide down until the terrain levels out, then we'll continue on foot. Molly's heart races as she peers over the edge, but she nods in agreement. All right, let's do it. Summers sits down and Molly positions herself behind him, clutching tightly. Hold on as tight as possible, ready? Summers initiate their slide over the slope's face at breakneck speed. Blinded by the heavy snowfall, 
Molly fears collisions with boulders or falling off a cliff. The cold pierces through her snow pants as she grips Summers and screams, the wind muffling her voice. Gradually, their momentum slows, finally halting on level ground. Molly stands and surveys their surroundings. A white sky, obscured visibility, but a seemingly less steep path ahead. Summers checks on her. Are you hurt? No, I think I'm okay, Molly responds and they set off. Shivering, Molly follows Summers into the whiteout, well aware that their steps could lead to either safety or peril. In this bleak, snow-covered expanse with no landmarks, their mission to save the others presents daunting risks, each stride fraught with the possibility of salvation or tragedy. Meanwhile, Rick Carter braces himself against fierce winds, dropped off by a snowcat at 8,500 feet or 2,600 meters elevation. They advance on foot following the climber's presumed path hampered by heavy supplies and unyielding winds. Carter observes Ed Hall, a longtime friend and expert climber, signaling a halt. Ed yells, we can't go higher. These 60 miles per hour winds are unheard of. My radio's freezing. Carter responds, tuck it under your jacket. We must reach those kids. Let's rope up and press on. Coiling a neon orange rope around their waists for safety, the men press forward, but the relentless winds overpower them, hurling them to the ground. At 9,700 feet or 2,900 meters, still far from the summit, Carter acknowledges their limits. We've reached our peak. Let's head east, away from the wind. He radios for caution, halting the next team's ascent, hoping for a slim chance of locating the climbers in this storm. Ordering this strategic retreat weighs heavily on Carter, fearing it might seal the climbers' fate in this tempest. The team digs a burrow to change clothes, shielding themselves from the fierce wind. Despite the brutal cold, they must press on eastward to evade the storm's full force. Carter worries, realizing this storm could endanger even the rescue team. Giles Thompson, sitting within the snow cave near the tunnel's entrance, wraps his arms around his knees, swaying as he gazes into the storm outside. Amidst the freezing darkness, a sliver of morning light sneaks in. Observing his shivering companions, Giles worries, especially for their leader, Father Tom Goman. He remained silent since Molly Shula and Ralph Summers departed an hour ago to seek help. Snow encroaches upon the cave entrance, threatening to seal them in. Armed with an ice axe due to the absence of a shovel, Giles prepares to clear the entrance when Allison and Eric, EOS sophomores, offer assistance. They propose widening the tunnel as they exit to relieve themselves. Giles agrees, wriggles into the tunnel, and scrapes the ice with the axe. However, as he re-enters, He's shocked to see more snow has almost sealed the opening. Frantically trying to break the encroaching ice, Giles fails, accidentally dislodging Eric's boot into the tunnel. Helpless, Giles collapses, realizing the dire situation. The outside and inside are both trapped, with no solution in sight. Meanwhile, Molly Shula struggles through the thick snow, attempting to follow Ralph Summers' tracks. However, Summers is nowhere to be seen, leaving her alone and disoriented amid a whiteout. Spotting Summer's footprint, relief washes over her, and they reunite under a snow-covered tree. With Summers suggesting they're in Little Zigzag Canyon, they move on, but Molly doubts his navigation, fearing it might hinder rescuers from finding the snow cave. Rick Carter assists Ed Hall, the final member, out of the shelter to change into their full layers for warmth. However, the time spent dressing and digging the bolt hole has cost them an hour. Despite being bundled, everyone continues shivering in the biting wind. Carter, observing the team's discomfort, decides it's time to retreat. He shouts over the gusts, proposing they head to Silcox Hut, a mid-mountain lodge located at 6,950 feet or 2,100 meters elevation on the mountain. Ed agrees, but a sudden gust catches Ed off guard, causing his glove to fly away. Left with only a thin layer on his hand, he's in danger of getting frostbite. The team pushes downhill. Carter worries about Ed's exposed hand and realizes they should have packed more gloves instead of just emergency supplies. Carter and his team finally reach Silcox's hut after a grueling retreat. Inside, they find temporary respite from the storm. The team is aiming to warm themselves while awaiting the snowcat for transportation down the mountain back to the lodge to regroup. Barry Wright, inside the base operations office at Timberline Resort, grapples with communication issues as his team struggle on the mountain. Coordination becomes impossible due to radios freezing in the deafening storm. Dave McClure brings news of additional volunteers on the way, 
but contact with ongoing teams remains sporadic and challenging. The mounting difficulties in communication deepen Wright's concern for both his teams and the missing students. Meanwhile, Ralph Summers and Molly Shula, relieved to spot a ski lift tower, realize they veered off course by two miles. With dwindling hope, they trudge towards the Mount Hood Meadows Resort, knowing it's crucial to return to civilization swiftly to save their fellow climbers. They reach Mount Hood Meadows Ski School headquarters. Upon entering with Molly close by, the room is filled with young employees. Summer speaks gingerly, stating that they're with a group of students lost on the mountain. Noticing their distress, a young employee rushes to call for help upon hearing Summer's introduction. Back at the Timberline Lodge, Wright eagerly anticipates Ralph Summer's arrival to receive more information about the snow cave's location. The climbers have been entrenched there for around 15 hours, heightening the urgency for clear guidance. Summers enters, recognizing Summer's evident exhaustion. Wright dives into the inquiry about the snow cave's whereabouts. Summers shares a tentative estimation of its location in White River Canyon. However, lacking certainty about the cave's elevation at around 7,200 feet, Summers admits he didn't have an altimeter. The absence of an altimeter troubles Barry deeply. It could have limited the search to a specific elevation. Now, the rescue teams face a sprawling search across various elevations, making a swift rescue significantly more challenging. The realization leaves Wright disheartened about the prospect of a timely rescue. Giles Thompson curls into a ball, huddling against the frigid dampness of the snow cave's floor. He'd fought to maintain the entrance for Eric Sandvik and Allison Litzenberger who are outside in the storm, but now he concedes defeat. Hours have slipped by without a word from either of them. The entrance has relentlessly shrunk over time. Giles gazes up at it. What was once a tunnel spacious enough for an adult to crawl through now resembles a narrow tube almost impenetrably dark within the cave. Teeth chattering, every inch of him ache, longing for respite. The shivering of the others has faded as time crawled on. Giles dreads looking around. Uncertainty looms about the other's survival. A voice breaks the eerie silence. It's Brenton Clark, another sophomore. Her words come out feeble and strained. I'm awake, Brenton. How are you holding up? Her reply echoes the weariness they both feel. Cold. Just like you, Giles. What's our move now? Giles tightens his hold on his knees, contemplating the question amidst the howling wind. We conserve our strength to endure, to survive. He rests his head, eyes closing involuntarily, a whisper of doubt lingering about the chance of reopening them in this dire situation. Hovering above Mount Hood's south side, Ralph Summers looks out from a military helicopter. He searches the snow-covered slopes below, longing for recognizable landmarks, yet all he sees is an endless expanse of white. It's been over 36 hours without sleep, but the search and rescue workers with him rely on his alertness. He's desperate to locate the rest of his climbing party before they succumb to the mountain's harshness. Time is running out. If they fail to locate the cave before nightfall, the climbers will endure another harrowing night. A grouping of boulders catches Summer's eye, but thick clouds swiftly obscure his view. Frustration and disappointment simmer as visibility worsens. They can't continue in these conditions, risking a collision with the mountainside. Descending, Summers grits his teeth, knowing the storm prevents any chance of finding the cave. Time is critical. Delay means risking lives. Meanwhile, Frank McGinnis, deeply troubled by his son's plight, seeks solace among rescue workers at the lodge. Their stories of past successful rescues offer a glimmer of hope amidst the storm's fury. Grateful for their efforts, he exits the restaurant, only to be ambushed by reporters seeking information on his son. His emotions whiplash, oscillating between hope and despair. Barry Wright, coordinating the search from Timberline Resort's makeshift base, feels a pang of optimism. The weather has eased, allowing three teams to scour the upper reaches of White River Canyon where they believe the snow cave might be located. Despite exhaustion, they persist, hoping these efforts will finally succeed in locating the stranded climbers. Even amidst darkness, the rescuers can now make better progress due to the favorable weather. Wright's attention perks up at a new transmission arriving at the base. It's from Team 7, reporting the discovery of tracks originating from somewhere above them, appearing to be left by two individuals moving downhill. Barry spots Ralph dozing nearby and urgently wakes him up. 
Together, they questioned the rescue worker for precise details about the track's location. Upon hearing the track's direction aligning with their own path, Summers reacts excitedly. He identifies them as the tracks he and Molly made. Instructing Team 7 to follow the tracks uphill, they anticipate a breakthrough. However, time ticks by without an update. Finally, the radio crackles with news from Team 7. They've reached 7,700 feet or 2,300 meters, yet the tracks have vanished. Despite the disappointment, Wright urges Team 7 to continue along the track's last known direction, hoping for the best. He senses Summer's disappointment, knowing his deep sense of responsibility for the missing climbers. But rest is crucial for Summers now. They plan to send him back up once daylight breaks, aiming for a more successful attempt to locate the snow cave. In another location, Rick Carter, aboard a military helicopter, is en route with a rescue team. They've received a lead indicating a possible sighting of a red object near White River Canyon. As the storm clears, the landscape becomes visible, revealing the canyon's features in stunning clarity. Carter spots something in the snow, realizing it's not a sleeping bag, but possibly something else. Carter spots the second object and reaches for the walkie-talkie beside him. Base operations, this is Carter speaking. Do you copy? He ponders his next words, aware of the open channel and the need for caution. We've spotted two individuals up here. We're landing for a closer inspection. Lowering the chopper, Carter deliberately used the term survivors to avoid causing alarm. However, as the helicopter descends, he acknowledges the slim possibility that if these objects are indeed people, their survival chances are low. Rescue workers rush about, journalists swarm deputies, and a reporter tries to intercept radio transmissions. Engaging an elderly man, Frank learns that there's significant activity. Reports hinting at a discovery by the rescuers. But as the reporter loses access to the transmissions, switching to a military channel, Frank senses the gravity of the situation. The shift to a military frequency signifies something potentially grave, a realization that dreads the possibility that the discovery might not entail survivors, but tragic loss. The fear of losing his son weighs heavily on his mind. Rick Carter observes a teenager curled up in the snow and other nearby. His colleagues confirm the absence of breathing or pulse, a layer of ice covering their faces. Carter's radio crackles with news of a spotted object higher in the canyon. He sighs, acknowledging the grim count of three, leaving eight climbers potentially alive. When a rescuer approaches, Carter instructs against disturbing the bodies, urging a continued search for survivors. Although not in an official role, his plea renews the search efforts. Further up the mountain, Ralph Summers boards a military helicopter, the clock ticking past 24 hours since the recovery of the deceased climbers. As they soar, Summers feels the weight of scrutiny from Rick Carter, who possibly blames him for the party's lack of an altimeter. Spotting a familiar terrain, Summers requests the pilot to land, hesitating but holding firm in his belief. With the helicopter grounded, Summers leads a team toward a recognized ridgeline, finally sensing they're on the right track. Carter and Charlie Eck, an SAR team member, cautiously navigate the snowy surface, anticipating the discovery of the snow cave. A probe hits something unfamiliar, softer than rock. Urgency builds as they unearth a yellow tarp and a green backpack. As Summers guides them, they race to dig into the snowdrift, feeling a mix of exhaustion and anticipation. Finding the cave, they prepare for a final confirmation. Carter continues digging on the glacier, certain the snow cave is beneath them. When Charlie unearths an opening, they hear a faint moan, triggering a rush of digging to find a safe entrance, hoping for more survivors. As Eck ventures deeper into the cave, his hands tremble, not solely due to the cold. Hope for more survivors drives him forward. Coming across four motionless teenagers and two adults, identified as the climbing group's leader, Father Tom Goldman, and the school's dean of students, Marion Horwell, Eck observes their protective positioning. The adults shielded the teens from the icy water, arranged like wax statues lying across their legs. Admiring Goman and Horwell's bravery, he checks for signs of life, starting with a blonde-haired boy, his frown deepening when he hears nothing. Eck moves methodically, trying to discern any vital signs. Ralph Summers stands near the snow cave, motionless, witnessing the extraction of Giles Thompson and Britton Clark. While both are alive, 
Summers worries about their chances without immediate hospital care. Standing at the edge, memories of his and Molly Shula's descent flash before him. As a rescue worker subtly indicates he shouldn't stay, Summers grasps the implications and walks back towards the nearest helicopter. Barry Wright rubs his tired eyes upon stepping into the Timberline Resort parking lot at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, May 15. For 62 hours, he remained steadfast at base operations, reluctant to leave until the rescue concluded. However, the impending arrival of survivors demands his presence. A Green Huey helicopter is expected to land, carrying survivors to be transferred to a nearby intensive care unit. Volunteering for the transfer team, Wright seeks to witness their arrival firsthand. Racing forward with other volunteers as the helicopter touches down, paramedics emerge, swiftly moving with a stretcher. Offering a blanket, Wright watches as it's draped over the patient, revealing a teenage boy with curly hair. Initially relieved by the boy's apparent consciousness, a closer look reveals a devastating truth. His wide, vacant eyes signify his passing. With a heavy heart, Wright covers his mouth in shock as paramedics respectfully cover the boy's face and transport him to the medevac helicopter. Having been part of numerous search and rescue missions, this particular outcome strikes a deeper chord within him, haunting him with the image of the boy's visage as he closes his eyes. The 1986 Mount Hood tragedy stands as the second most severe alpine disaster in North American history with two survivors, Brenton Clark and Giles Thompson, who had to have both legs amputated due to frostbite. It claimed nine precious lives. Richard Hader, Patrick McGinnis, Tasha Amy, Susan McClave, Father Tom Goman, Marion Horwell, Allison Litzenberger, Aaron O'Leary, and Eric Sandvik. In response, Oregon Episcopal School suspended its base camp outdoor program and conducted a comprehensive investigation to comprehend the circumstances. In July of that year, a panel of experts suggested that Goman might have been impacted by hypothermia, potentially affecting his judgment. Susan McClave's father expressed, we will never truly understand why he continued climbing, but he was a good man who wouldn't jeopardize his or anyone else's life. Giles Thompson pursued a degree in drama from Colorado College, later working as a master artisan with various theater companies in Seattle, Washington. Britton Clark, the other Snow Cave survivor, was discharged from the hospital in May 1986 without complications. Molly Shula graduated from OES in 1986 and pursued English studies at the University of Oregon. Despite providing a statement to the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department, she has maintained silence on the tragedy in public. Ralph Summers earned an advanced degree in sociology and counseled mental health patients. While criticized by some media outlets initially, others acknowledged that his actions, including digging a snow cave and seeking help with Molly Shula, saved Giles Thompson and Brenton Clark. Frank McGinnis grappled profoundly with his son's loss, but has embarked on a healing journey over the years. His younger son, Chris, now a meteorologist and traffic reporter in Portland, welcomed a son in 2017 named Patrick, a cherished addition to Frank's life. For Brian Boland, his hot air balloon flight would be horrific. In 1971, a young Brian Boland found himself in Brooklyn, New York, facing a tight deadline for his master's thesis at the Pratt Institute. Struggling to find an idea, he stumbled upon a Sports Illustrated article about the resurgence of hot air ballooning, thanks to introducing a more cost-effective and manageable onboard burner system fueled by bottled propane. This new technology allowed for greater flexibility and control, replacing the traditional use of hydrogen and helium gases. Captivated by the idea, Brian grew up on Long Island with a curious mind and a thirst for new experiences. Ballooning perfectly matched his love for precision and mechanical whimsy. He swiftly drafted a proposal at Pratt and spent the following eight months toiling away in the basement of his shared apartment, where he resided with his wife and son, meticulously designing and sewing a balloon. Presenting it on campus, he referred to it as a sculpture, never ceasing to perceive balloons as unique art forms. According to Kathy Wadsworth, his second wife, Brian, viewed balloons as conceptual works of art, there for a moment, then gone, altering the landscape. 
Brian returned to this artistic concept repeatedly throughout his life. He served as an art and photography teacher in Farmington, Connecticut. One of his former students, Paul Stump, later became a balloonist in Vermont, crediting Brian as a mentor who granted him the freedom to pursue his passions. The allure of ballooning lies in its simplicity. Heated air, less dense than the surrounding air, rises and allows the balloon to ascend in the direction the wind blows. By adjusting the heat, the balloon can be controlled to descend. It's a captivating blend of science and art, a graceful dance with the winds that Brian Boland carried with him throughout his life. Boland left his teaching job to devote himself to ballooning. He engaged in various aspects of the ballooning world, instruction, flying passengers, writing about ballooning, repairs, and most importantly, designing and creating unique balloons. He preferred unconventional events like a contest in Ireland where participants had to land a balloon nearest a pub and return to the starting point with a pint of Guinness without spilling a drop. In 1982, Boland and Wadsworth embarked on an audacious feat, ascending the face of Venezuela's Angel Falls, the tallest waterfall in the world. Despite facing adverse weather conditions, Boland displayed unwavering fearlessness and complete presence during the ascent. In 1988, Boland stumbled upon an airport for sale in Post Mills, Vermont, and saw it as an opportunity to realize his vision of a life dedicated to ballooning. He transformed the 50-acre space into a creative haven, complete with tree houses, motorized furniture, and a workshop home combination made of raw wood and large windows overlooking fields and runways. Balloon apprentices found inspiration and learning opportunities in the loft space called the Thinkatorium. By the late 1980s, Boland's living space had evolved into a treasure trove of eclectic collections, showcasing fire trucks, wicker baskets, vintage vehicles, and various artifacts worldwide. His neighbors affectionately referred to it as Brian's Museum of Rusty Dusty Stuff, where he celebrated the beauty of patina, the signs of age and use that he considered an art form in themselves. Boland's creative spirit resonated widely, as evidenced by the annual Experimental Balloon and Airship Association meet he hosted for fellow home builders, embracing offbeat ballooning. Apprentices revered him as a nonconformist role model who fearlessly pursued his passions and refused to be confined to mundane societal norms. The world knew him not just as a skilled balloonist, but as a visionary whose courage and dedication to his chosen path inspired many to embrace their true creative selves. By 2005, Brian Boland had experienced three divorces. One fortuitous day, he landed his balloon in the yard adjacent to the home of Tina Foster, a professor of obstetrics and gynecology at Dartmouth's Geisel School of Medicine. With a whimsical proposal to fly a bathtub up to the roof, Tina joined him, eventually becoming his romantic partner. While Boland was always open to sharing his passion for ballooning with friends and enthusiasts who visited Post Mills, he seldom delved into the depths of his private life, allowing glimpses of it to emerge through his artistic expressions. In 2010, Boland paid a heartfelt tribute to his late son, Jeff, who had tragically passed away at 25. Using scrap wood and inspired by a tiny wire figure Jeff had created, Boland constructed a colossal dinosaur sculpture aptly named Vermontosaurus. A bureaucratic dispute arose when the town classified the sculpture as a structure and demanded a permit, but Boland insisted it was a sculpture not subject to such regulations. After some resistance, the town eventually permitted the massive tribute to remain. At the age of 71 in 2020, Boland faced health challenges, including heart surgery to repair a faulty valve and an aortic aneurysm following a hernia operation. During his recovery, a kidney tumor was discovered during a CT scan. Despite the hardships, Boland remained determined to return to his life's pursuits, with dreams of completing his transformation of an old bus into a diner and above all, flying again. After a long and arduous journey, the doctors finally gave him the green light. In the spring of 2021, the skies once again became Brian Boland's playground, allowing him to soar with his beloved balloons. Brian Boland's passion for ballooning attracted numerous admirers and aspiring pilots who affectionately referred to his rural residence and airport in Post Mills, Vermont, as the Island of Lost Boys. Under Boland's mentorship, they embarked on a journey to learn the art of ballooning from a master iconoclast. Locally, Boland was renowned as the Balloon Man, 
a towering figure standing at six foot four, adorned with a beard, wire gray hair concealed under a fisherman's cap, and eyes people believed could perceive the wind's invisible whispers. On the serene evening of July 15th, 2021, Boland exuded ease and tranquility as he prepared for a flight. The conditions were optimal, moderate winds, clear visibility of 10 miles, and the sun's golden rays embracing the landscape. Boland's passengers on this occasion were Emily Blake, her 10-year-old daughter, and her parents Ellen, 67, and Roger, 73. Although locals and familiar with Boland's ballooning reputation, it was their first time flying with him. As the balloon ascended, any initial pre-flight jitters dissipated, replaced by a sense of calm, induced by Boland's evident expertise, nurtured by an impressive 11,000 hours of flying experience. Emily's daughter sought comfort by intertwining her hand with her grandmother's, and together, they marveled at the breathtaking views while soaring over 3,000 feet or 900 meters above the ground. Approximately half an hour into the flight, Boland communicated with their chase driver, Aaron Johnson, to coordinate their direction and course. It was then that Emily noticed a subtle change in Boland's demeanor. He began patting his pockets in apparent search of something. Soon after, the balloon's altitude dropped alarmingly, and Boland's anxiety became palpable as he frantically circled the basket, searching compartments for a solution. Concerned for their safety, Emily inquired about the issue. Boland informed her that the burner's pilot light had gone out and required a striker to reignite it. Despite Emily's willingness to assist, Boland remained unresponsive, preoccupied with his search. Helpless, Emily and her parents watched as the ground rapidly approached, marked by the distinct boundaries of a nearby tasseled cornfield. As the balloon seemed mere moments away from impact, Boland acted swiftly, grabbing a plastic bag with his teeth to access a backup igniter. His skilled hands maneuvered the igniter to the darkened pilot light, eliciting a spark that ignited a flame. Boland then injected more gas into the balloon's vast envelope, its roar signaling a surge of heat and buoyancy. The immediate crisis averted, Boland's expertise again saved the day, steering them away from a potentially catastrophic landing. Yet, little did they know, this was only the beginning of a harrowing and life-altering journey that would test their resilience and determination in unforeseen ways. Boland's urgent command echoed through the air, imploring them to bend their knees for an imminent rebound. However, as they hit the field, the expected bounce didn't materialize. Instead, the impact tipped the basket, causing both Boland and Ellen to be thrown overboard. Meanwhile, the balloon, now pilotless but newly refired and buoyant, lifted off again, ascending with astonishing speed, leaving Emily, her daughter, and her dad Roger on board, bewildered and without any knowledge of how to fly the craft. The true peril they were facing began to sink in as Emily peered over the side of the basket. She spotted a familiar brown loafer wedged into a strap securing one of the propane tanks. Assuming it belonged to Boland and had come off during the chaos, her heart sank at the realization of the danger he had faced. But then, a voice emerged from beneath the basket, a voice that was unmistakably Boland's. Incredulously, Emily looked over the rail again, only to discover her initial assumption was incorrect. The loafer was still on Boland's foot. He was hanging precariously below the basket with one foot caught and one hand barely clutching a small handle meant for carrying the basket. His other arm and leg dangled freely over an expansive void. Overwhelmed by the gravity of the situation, Emily recalled the voice of her training as a former EMT, urging her to act. The balloon had a drop line, typically used for ground crew assistance during landings. Could they use it to hoist Boland back into the basket? Could Boland contribute to his own rescue? The answers weren't immediately clear, especially considering they were far from their original cruising altitude, leaving them with limited options. Determined not to leave Boland behind, Emily pleaded with him to get back into the basket, but Boland stubbornly refused, insisting they abandon him. A tense back and forth ensued, with Emily desperately urging Boland to reconsider, knowing they needed his expertise to navigate the balloon safely. Then, in a surprising twist, Boland began giving instructions, though the plan remained uncertain. Their predicament seemed increasingly dire with two daunting landing options, an unpredictable water landing or a risky field landing. Emily's daughter could swim, but not proficiently, and the thought of Boland dangling below the basket during a ground landing filled them all with dread. 
Time seemed to slow as almost an hour passed since their initial takeoff, and the balloon continued its eastward course toward New Hampshire. Far below, life went on in the town of Bradford, completely unaware of the life and death struggle playing out above. In this heart-pounding and surreal experience, Emily, her family, and Boland grappled with an unimaginable challenge, a challenge that held the fate of each life aboard the hot air balloon in a precarious balance. Striving to comply with Boland's instructions, Roger followed suit by supplying the balloon with bursts of gas-heated air, then allowing it to float, and finally providing more air as required. Despite the balloon's seemingly straightforward controls, its vulnerability to the wind became evident. In a later newspaper interview, Roger admitted, You can't steer. I had no idea what I was doing. As the daylight began to wane, the valley below was painted with a gentle pink hue. Emily glanced at her father only to see him trembling, mirroring the anxiety she felt, as did her daughter. As the clock neared 7.45 p.m., Boland's guidance ceased abruptly. Emily's gaze returned to the side of the basket. There she observed Boland's face contorted with a mix of desperation and exhaustion, now a deep shade of crimson. I can't hold on much longer, he uttered in a faint whisper. After about ten minutes of flying, Boland was hanging under the basket when he fell silent. The NTSB's preliminary accident report indicated that, at this point, he managed to free his foot and was gripping the balloon with his hands. Emily held onto the drop line between her knees, hoping Boland would accept it if she threw it to him. As they approached the western edge of the river, she heard him exclaim, Oh, shit. Before she could see him fall, she felt the release of Boland's weight from the balloon. He fell face up, his eyes visible, and Emily knew that surviving a fall from that height was impossible. Her father reacted, asking, Oh my God, now what? Her ten-year-old daughter expressed fear and asked if they were going to die. Emily gazed into her daughter's eyes and reassured her, saying, It's very possible, but we're going to do the best we can. You need to trust me. It was a heavy burden to place on a young child, but there was no other choice. Emily grabbed a walkie-talkie and contacted Johnson, the chase vehicle driver and pilot in training. She informed him that her mother and Boland were no longer in the balloon. Johnson, a former U.S. Army Special Forces member, knew he couldn't change what happened. His focus was on preventing a greater catastrophe. He visualized the river and the fields of New Hampshire as Emily described them, and he instructed Roger on maneuvering the balloon. The winds shifted and confused them as they neared the river's eastern shore and drifted westward. Johnson guided Roger on descending to a lower elevation, hoping the winds would reverse and lead them back toward New Hampshire, away from the embankment's trees. Emily worried they might land in water, but an idea struck her when she saw the tree branches below. She pulled the balloon's vent cord, releasing hot air and allowing the branches to act as an anchor, gently guiding them to the ground. Once they landed, they quickly made their way to solid ground and Johnson arrived in the chase van. Calls were made to 911 and Emily's partner. Ellen, who had safely fallen from the basket earlier, mistakenly assumed they had completed the flight. In the van on the way back to Vermont, the rush of adrenaline subsiding, Emily caught sight of Boland lying in a field. He had narrowly missed the water. She remembered his struggle to hold on and then his peaceful acceptance when gravity eventually took over. He hadn't resisted. It was as if he embraced the inevitability of his fall. Following Boland's passing, the NTSB initiated an accident investigation published in August of 2021. The report highlighted an inconsistency in the information Boland provided to federal authorities during the balloon's registration process. Boland had stated that the balloon was manufactured by Cameron Balloons, a prominent balloon company headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan. However, this turned out to be inaccurate. In reality, none of the components were from Cameron Balloons. According to the investigation, the basket and burner were produced by Galaxy Balloons, a smaller manufacturer. The propane tanks were from Worthington, and Boland himself crafted the colorful envelope with rainbow patterns. The type of balloon used fell under the experimental category as classified by the FAA. Generally, such experimental balloons are not authorized for transporting commercial passengers. However, it remains unclear whether the specific type of balloon played a role in the accident. Emily has grappled with numerous what-ifs and scenarios, replaying in her mind how she could have handled things differently. Initially, she was hesitant to be out in public, fearing the lingering questions and insensitive remarks from others. 
Therapy became a crucial step in processing the traumatic experience, teaching her the importance of opening up and sharing her feelings for healing to occur. During a memorial service held for Boland at Post Mills Airport the previous summer, various speakers took turns expressing their fond memories of witnessing Boland in his balloons, soaring above the mundane realities of life, transcending the ordinary. Boland's unwavering commitment to ballooning as an art form left them in awe. Whenever we saw Brian in his balloons, one neighbor recounted, no matter what was happening elsewhere in this country or the world, somehow it felt like all was good. For Boland, ballooning was a sacred quest and once he found it he clung to it with unyielding passion. The enchantment of the experience never diminished for him. Even after years of flying he would still look up at the balloon and be captivated by it. With all the years that I've been doing this, he told Vermont Public Television in 2014, every now and then I look up inside the balloon and it's empty. There's nothing, except it's full of magic. For the Kim family, their Pacific Northwest road trip would be a nightmare. The Kim family decided to spend Thanksgiving of 2006 with some of their family in Seattle. While this trip was for family time and fun, it also served another purpose. The Kim family had been looking for a new place to live, and they thought Seattle would be a good fit. They spent the holiday with their family, and then, on November 24, 2006, they began their drive home. The family made a quick stop in Portland so that Katie could have lunch with one of her friends. They spent the night in a hotel. The original plan was for the family to drive back to their home in San Francisco, California. Katie suggested that they stay in Portland for part of the day, drive halfway home, and then stay somewhere else for the night instead of driving all day. James thought it was a good idea too, and they pulled out a road map. They found a nice spot for them to stop that was right between where they were and their home. They decided to stay at the Tututun Lodge on the Oregon coast, located near Gold Beach. The Kim family left Portland later that afternoon and began driving south. At about 9 p.m., the family grew hungry and pulled off the road for late dinner at a Denny's in Roseburg, Oregon. The Kims decided that taking Highway 42, an exit not far from the restaurant, would be the best route to reach the Oregon coast. From this restaurant to the lodge was about a two and a half hour drive. When they were about two hours into their drive, James realized that he had missed their turn. They pulled over and looked at a map. They began looking on the map for an alternative route, and they believed that they had found one. The road they had found was called Bear Camp Road, but the map couldn't have warned them of how dangerous this road was. There was a sign posted just before the road that read, Danger, remote road system ahead. Danger, you could get stranded and die. Bear Camp Road is off driven in summer, but potentially treacherous in winter. More than a decade earlier, the same road had claimed the life of an RV salesman from Montana named DeWitt Finley, who starved to death after getting stuck in 1994. When they hit the fork in the road at milepost 12, where Bear Camp looks more like the side route, they started seeing snowfall which may have contributed to their decision to take the unfortunate route, BLM Road 34836. In winter, the Forest Service does not close Bear Camp Road because it is a popular recreation area for hunters, snowmobilers, and people seeking Christmas trees. Most winter road use comes from local residents and those drivers are better prepared for the conditions. Terry Stone tried to warn the couple about driving to the coast at night with two young children. When Katie called to make reservations, I asked them where they were. I knew that they had young children with them and would be better to find something right off the highway. It seemed like too much to get to the lodge at that late hour, she said, but James was determined to stay at the lodge. Call the innkeeper back and tell her there was nothing more I wanted than to wake up at her lodge, James said. Katie called Stone back and she reserved a room for the Kims if you're not prepared for what's ahead of you, it can be bone rattling and frightening. It's a long, windy mountain pass. Even in the best of times, it's very treacherous, Terry said. Had informed Stone on which route they were taking, she would have advised against it. Never do we recommend the Bear Camp Road to get to the lodge or do anyone I know of suggest to anyone to go that way, she said. 
The road started at 900 feet or 275 meters of elevation, but very quickly inclined to 4,000 feet or 1,220 meters. On the other side of the mountain was the lodge in Gold Beach. The road was paved, but it was incredibly narrow, with many steep drop-offs and no guardrails. The road was not plowed or maintained in the winter and was only meant to be driven during the summer. The road was very isolated, and if you had car troubles on the road, you were on your own. All of a sudden we're driving in snow, and that is when we started to get very concerned, Katie Kim said. Her concerns were warranted. In fact, she should have been terrified. They missed another crucial turnoff that would have led them to safety. They veered off to a dangerous narrow logging road that should have been closed. They were now headed down a road into the depths of the Oregon wilderness that had been abandoned for the winter. The road became more rugged and snow was piling up on the road. Their Subaru was now traversing over snowy, rocky terrain. It was very scary at that point and I said, James, this isn't right, Katie said. James had the windshield wipers on full power and he was gripping the steering wheel with white knuckles. Even with the wipers, it was nearly impossible to see outside. James drove for several more miles in horrible conditions. Sometimes the road was so clustered with rocks and tree branches that James had to put the car in park and get out to clear the road. She tried to call 911 but had no service. Katie finally tells James they needed to reverse the car and go back out the way they came in. James agreed and for hours James drove the car in reverse through the narrow and winding road with steep drop-offs on one side. He had to open the car door to see the road better. Finally, they returned to a fork in the road that they had seen hours before and decided it was too unsafe to drive any further. Plus, James was exhausted and believed it was best to sleep for the night and evaluate the situation in the morning. They left the car on for warmth. When they woke up, they were faced with a dilemma with a three-way fork. Katie and James looked over the map and tried to assess where they were. They could have gone back on the road that they had originally driven, which they knew was terrible and unsafe, or they could try to turn left and go down the mountain. The road to the left looked much wider than the roads they had been on, but there were no signs for this road. Ultimately, they decided to stay put and believed being stranded at a fork in the road would increase the likelihood of being found. The Kims found themselves stranded in a foreign environment, mountains, remote canyons, and logging roads that led to nowhere. They had seen a snowplow at the entrance to Bear Camp Road and believed that a snowplow must come through to plow the road regularly. The family stayed inside the car that day, eating snacks and playing games, they waited to be rescued, but no one came that day. By the end of that night on Sunday, they started to convince themselves that the plows must not have come through on the weekends, and that they just needed to wait for the following morning. On Monday, James and Katie tried their best to keep their spirits high for the kids. They played games, read stories to their daughters, and ate more snacks. They periodically honked their horn just in case anyone came close enough to hear them, by Monday night, James and Katie were getting very worried. They were almost out of food, and in order to keep the kids well-fed, Caddy began to breastfeed both of her daughters. It was this night when they heard something rumbling in the bushes. Petrified, Katie looks out of the window and spots a bear lurking in the foliage. James honks the horn to scare them away, but it didn't seem to work. Tuesday morning rolled around and they were still stranded. Food was getting dangerously low. James went out of the car and drug through bear droppings to find berries for his family to eat. They ate some of the berries but decided to stop just in case the berries would poison them. The daughters had been acting out the day before but stopped on Tuesday. They were scared and lethargic. They kept to themselves and seemed to just shut down. On Wednesday morning, the family ran out of gas. They no longer had a way to heat themselves and the car grew very cold. It was so very cold we couldn't sleep because our bones ached. Katie said. If they won't come to rescue us, maybe they would come to rescue the forest, James said. James took off one of the tires in an attempt to light it and cause a fire. Getting the tire to burn was a long and exhausting struggle. The smoke wouldn't rise above the trees. He threw whatever he could into the fire to fuel it. They succeeded in increasing the flame and the black smoke rose above trees. The family was elated and finally had a semblance of hope. But elation was short-lived as they heard a plane above, but it didn't spot them. Later that night, the bears returned. The family could hear bears again. They were sniffing and moaning, walking around the car. 
and for the first time they thought that they might not survive the night. Back in their hometown of San Francisco, a family friend noticed that they had not returned yet. The family was supposed to come home on Monday, but now it was Wednesday. This friend went to the police to report them missing, and a search party was being put together. Of course, the Kim family would have had no way of knowing that. James Kim's father also got involved in the search. He hired Carson helicopters based in Merlin to join the search. As details of the missing family became known, media descended on Southwest Oregon as the story of the disappearance of the Kim family made national news. When word got out three days later, the initial search area was huge. Much of Southwest Oregon, recalled Phil Turnbull, chief for Rural Metro Fire Department. But it slowly narrowed as details trickled out including a cell phone ping discovered by Edge Wireless Engineers from a tower near Glendale. They plotted a wedge shape to the west that covered the Bear Camp Road area, but it also covered areas north of the Rogue River, and a week had already passed since the Kims had become stranded. Turnbull was a search and rescue volunteer and planning section chief in the Kim search. He'd seen plenty of searches, but this one was different, with officials from around the state and national media attention. All of a sudden, there was a lot of brass in that room, Turnbull said this week. We had CNN satellite rigs parked outside the command post. This was a little bit of a circus, he said. On Thursday morning, James and Katie began to accept the real possibility that they might die. They began to plan for the worst. James had been studying the roadmap to see if he could brave the snow and seek help. He found a town that he believed was only four miles away called Galice. James told Katie that he believed he could get to the town in a matter of hours and ask for help. Katie agreed to let him go, thinking that it was the only option that they had. On December 2nd, James left the car in just tennis shoes and a light jacket. It was much scarier without him there. We were really alone, just myself and two little babies. I was terrified, Katie said, but she believed in James. He has never let her down. James started down the road for hours and eventually decided to follow a river thinking that it might lead to Gallus or another town. After walking for far too long, James began to think that he had either taken a wrong turn or that he had underestimated how far the town actually was. As darkness crept over the Kims, she knew something was wrong. It turned dark and I realized we had a problem. It was 11 and he still had not returned. It was so cold and couldn't imagine what it would be like outside of the car. I start thinking he's probably not coming back, she said. Two days passed and James did not return. Katie feared for the worst. She decided her only chance was the hike out as well. So Katie, with her two young girls, begins their trek into the wilderness. Two hours in, because she was severely dehydrated, she started to hallucinate. Even in her weakened mental state, she heard helicopters toward where the car was. They turned around back to the car. I heard aircraft approaching and tried to signal for them. I was so physically exhausted and depressed, I felt like there wasn't much hope anymore. Just when she lost all hope, Katie Kim was finally spotted. It was private pilot John Raker of Central Point who finally connected the dots. Raker, who owned 11 Burger Kings in Southern Oregon before becoming a Jackson County Commissioner in 2008, had flown over the search area many times on the way to his cabin near Agnes. He read about the Kims in the newspaper and got in his helicopter at about the same time that hordes of searchers were focusing on the Bear Camp Road area. He knew well the long, winding road that descended toward Black Bar Lodge and beyond, into the Rogue River's wild canyon. He knew there were actually several roads and played a hunch. He got within a mile of the Kim's car the first day, then on the second day, went back. I was following bear prints, which are round, and I saw these long, thin ones, Rayshaw remembered. I could hover within 10 feet, I could see treads, I knew they were fresh. He lost those prints, evidently made by James Kim. But at some point he looked down to see a woman waving an umbrella, jumping up and down with children nearby. Raker couldn't land, but soon a Croman S-61 dropped survival gear, and another pilot was able to land within 200 yards of the Kim's Saab. Within a half hour, Katie and the girls landed at the Grants Pass Airport in Merlin. By then they had been stranded for nine days. James had torn off pieces of his clothes as he walked through the snow. It is believed he was doing this so that he could find his way back or so that someone could find him if necessary. Another theory would say that he was tearing off his clothes because he was getting too hot, which is a symptom of hypothermia. 
When Katie and her children were rescued, she first believed it was because James had gotten to the town and told rescuers to come and get them. But to her horror, she discovered that James had never made it to the town. He'd eaten little for more than a week. Although he had a warm jacket, he had no hat. He ended up walking more than 20 miles. He had no chance once he descended into the canyon. He was probably dead before his family was rescued. James's body was found on December 6th at noon. He was discovered in Big Windy Creek, laying on his back in two feet of icy water. He was wearing the rest of his clothes and was identified by the papers that he was carrying with him in his backpack. His body was sent in to be examined, and an autopsy report revealed that he had died of hypothermia. It was estimated that James had died two days after leaving the safety of his car. Joe Hyatt, now the fire marshal for Grants Pass Fire and Rescue, led the team that went into Big Windy after Kim's footprints were spotted turning off of a logging road. He described how team members got a strong feel for James Kim's final hours by descending the harsh canyon, full of fallen trees, snow, and sheer canyon walls. Hyatt said the young father made the ultimate sacrifice. The only way we could proceed down that canyon was to be in the water in our dry suits, Hyatt said. I drew on every ounce of my experience taking my team into that canyon. We talked about what he must have gone through. In 2009, Katie Kim and the girls made a surprise emotional appearance at Josephine County Search and Rescue's Christmas banquet. That was shortly after she rode with Ray Kaur and Sarah Rubrecht, rescue coordinator during the ordeal, to the site of their stranding, where three years earlier she breastfed her girls to keep them alive, and where the family burned tires to stay warm after their car ran out of gas. The route to and along Bear Camp Road has other signs that have been erected since the incident to help drivers avoid the fate of the Kim family. In an opinion piece in the Washington Post a year after his son's death, James's dad, Spencer Kim, criticized the local authorities who conducted the search, the legal barriers to procuring crucial credit card and phone use information in a timely way, interference from the national media, and the gate leading to the desolate logging road was left unlocked. If the gate had been properly signed and locked, he argued, his son would never have driven 21 miles down the road. Several days before Kim's article, Senator Dianne Feinstein from California sent a letter to Interior Secretary Dirk Kempthorne complaining about the gate and demanding an investigation. But even if the search and rescue effort had been flawless, the results might not have changed. The disappearance of the Kim family and the untimely death of James Kim is not really about an unlocked gate, nor is it about credit cards or the purported shortcomings of any member of the search parties that tried to rescue the family. Every winter in the high mountains of the United States brings new stories of travelers who take wrong turns, skiers who wander off groomed slopes, and snowmobilers who run out of gas miles from civilization. In an era of cell phones and GPS, it's hard for those inexperienced in the wild to understand that it is still possible to get well and truly lost. It is still possible to be overwhelmed by the forces of nature, and there is not yet any foolproof remedy for human error and a lack of luck. Since the tragedy, county authorities in the area have made dramatic improvements. Perhaps the most important outcome is the creation of CORSAR, California-Oregon Regional Search and Rescue. Eight local counties now work together and share resources on search operations, they also gather in the summer for training. Search and rescue is a million times better than it was in 2006 because of relationships, sharing of resources and cross-training, Sarah Rubrek said. Despite the circumstances that led to the tragedy, James Kim's heartbreaking effort to save his family while famished, freezing and exhausted left an impression. James Kim put himself through a desperate ordeal, climbing down a ravine over boulders and logs, through the nearly impenetrable brush and in and out of an icy creek, in what one rescue leader called a superhuman effort to save his family. It was amazing what he went through to get as far as he did, said Hyatt. It proved the love he had for his family. The towering trees and mountains, witnesses to countless stories of triumph and despair, stand as silent sentinels, cradling the shattered pieces of a love story lost to the unforgiving wilderness, in the vast expanse of the untamed wilderness, where the echoes of nature's symphony reverberate through ancient trees and shimmering lakes, tragedies unfold in poignant silence. A heart 
once filled with the boundless hope that only nature's embrace can offer, can be shattered amidst the solitude of towering mountains and endless horizons. We are left with a tapestry woven with threads of grief, the vibrant colors dulled by the relentless gray of sorrow. Yet even in the depths of despair, nature offers a flicker of hope. The sun, unwavering in its rise, reminds us that new beginnings bloom even in the wake of loss. We carry the weight of tragedy, a heavy burden etched onto our souls. But as we navigate the wilderness of grief, we find strength in the echoes of shared memories, in the love that transcends the boundaries of life and loss. We may forever bear the scars of this experience, but they will also serve as a testament to the profound connection we share a connection that even the wilderness could not extinguish. Thank you for watching. This is the Outdoor Disasters Heartbreaking Tragedies Marathon. Thank you for watching. One more outdoor disaster content. Check out these stories I believe you'll enjoy.